So that's the announcements. That's what we got. So now we're going to transition to the message. And I love preaching, um, especially excited about today, because uh, as we like to say at the mission, two are better than one. So I'm not teaching this sermon alone. A few months back, back in the fall, we had something called a teacher training. It was three sessions, three Tuesday nights in a row, where I invited uh, a few folks, a handful of people who have the spiritual gift of teaching and to fan that gift into flame. And one of the people was Lisa Schlinka. And uh, her and her family, the Schlinka family, have been attending the mission for eight years, which is pretty awesome. And she has served on a number of roles at the mission over the years, currently is a key member of our advisory board, as well as a key leader of the sisterhood, which is our women's ministry. And so she got, she did the three sessions. We did a bunch of feedback and critique with all the teachers, fan that gift into flame. And we're talking about, okay, so you went through teacher training, what's next? What's, What's the next step? And we thought a perfect next step would be to teach a portion of a sermon. And we thought, why not today? And so she is going to kick things off for us today, and I'm going to wrap up. So Lisa, welcome. Would you welcome her as she comes up? And I, um, so again, she's going to begin. I have to take my notes off so she doesn't start preaching what I got. I don't want to preach what you got. Put mine over there. Got some pens and stuff up here too. But um, I'm, I'm just really excited again. She, she taught at, at the first service, and um, it's just been I survived. Heat survived, <laughs> has been a huge blessing to our church family, and I, I pray just prophetically what you shared in circle time. Uh, once again, I pray that let her run. It's just a word that, that uh, just God has for her. So may you run. May Thank you run you. well. And Thank I'll, you. I'll be back up in just a few minutes. Fun, fun times. You know, um, he was talking about training the teachers, and I, I came up here on Wednesday and practiced with Dan, and he was like, you know, you're, you're like doing a lunge as you teach. You're, you're doing walking lunges, so I'm going to try not to do squats as as we do this thing. Um, I, I kind of do like to move around, um, but I'm gonna, I took that to heart. No lunges. So as Dan said, my family and I have been a part of this church for eight years, and I really felt compelled to share that if you're new to our church, um, if you're watching online, this is truly a place that you can call home. And when I think about a home, I think about a place where you can agree to disagree. You can have different opinions. You can press into things together, and you're just doing life together in an authentic way. And that's really the way I describe this church, just an authentic, awesome place. And so um, I've been preparing for this teach uh, for a couple of weeks, and I've been excited about it. But in that couple of weeks, I have been nervous about it, too. And um, I decided, you know, I'm going to get some prayer about that. I'm feeling nervous, and I just want to get that off me. And so I asked a friend here at church to pray with me, and she did. She prayed with me. It was great. And then after she prayed, she said, you know, those nervous feelings just might not go away. You might just have to get up there and do that thing scared. And I was like, ooh, that's, that's like bad news. I, I, my typical thinking is first overcome the nervousness and then go out and speak. But God wanted to show me something new. And he wanted to show me something about that pattern of thinking. And I knew there was a lesson in it for me. And that's what I'm going to be sharing here with you today. And so that brings us to our first key thought, which is this. While our feelings are a vital component of our humanity, they are not always aligned with the truth. Ain't that the truth? Um, This really highlights something super important about our identity that I'm going to be unpacking. And I want to start off by saying that feelings are not the enemy. Feelings are wonderful. They are what makes us human. But we need to keep in mind that they are not always aligned with truth. And so last week, we looked at some passages that speak about our identity. The one I would like to review is from Galatians, Galatians 4, 4 through 7. And it says this, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. 
And because we are his children, God has sent us the spirit of son, sonship into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Now, there's some mind-boggling truths and implications in this passage. To do a breakdown for you, we see first that we were slaves to the law. We were freed by the Son of God. Now that we are free, we're adopted into God's family. We were given the spirit of sonship, and by that spirit, we can call God Abba Father. And not only are we God's children, we're his heirs. Now at a glance, as Dan mentioned last week, when we read that, when we read those verses, we might just kind of read over them. But I also think there's a handful of us, and maybe even more than that, that we actually stop, we hover over those verses, we underline keywords, we highlight key thoughts, and we spend time with it. But if we're honest, and we don't need to answer this one out loud, does what we read really change who we say we are? Now, don't feel bad if your answer is no, because I completely relate to the no answer. If you also struggle to say you are a child of God, a logical question to ask is why? What is at the heart of the problem? Now, what I don't think is the heart of the problem is that we don't desire to live like children of God. We do desire to live like children of God. We desire to naturally and comfortably call him Papa. We desire to be considered an heir. So why don't we? Why don't we identify as God's kids? After all, that is what he says we are. Well, I don't think there's one answer to that question, but the Holy Spirit helped me to see this. Sometimes you just have to do it scared. And I want to explain that a little bit more. See, could it be that we don't identify with the truths in Galatians 4 because we don't feel like the things it says? The truths are visible to us. We're reading them. We're seeing them. However, the thought that we reinforce begins with a conjunction, but. But I don't feel like a son or daughter. I don't feel like the spirit of sonship indwells me. I don't feel like an heir of the Father. And I don't feel free from sin. And we conclude, and I think it's often unintentionally, that because we're not feeling it, it isn't true for us. Or maybe we decide, until I feel those things God says I am, I cannot live like a child of God. But here's the kicker. What if our feelings never catch up to those thoughts? It's just like me wanting to feel comfortable before coming up on stage to speak. We may just have to embrace that we are children of God, regardless of how we feel. Or even better, we get to embrace. We have permission to embrace that we are children of God, even if we don't feel it. And so that brings us to a key thought here, and it is this. We need to know that we are children of God, even when we don't feel it. We need to mix it with a mustard seed of faith. My husband and I, we moved from uh, Fort Worth, Texas to Troy, Michigan in our first year of marriage. Now, if you don't know my husband, he's German. So I had a lot of transition going on um, when we first got married and now as a foreigner living in a foreign land. I was born in the warm deserts of El Paso. And if you didn't realize, Texans have a strong state identity. And uh, when I was talking to Dan about this, as I was preparing, he asked me an interesting question. He asked me, how old were you when you realized you were a Texan? And I was like, well, as soon as we pop up, they stamp us with the star of Texas. There is no realization. We grow up singing songs about Texas. We say things like, do right by Texas. Don't mess with Texas. What would Texas do? Make Texas proud. And uh, I never thought, hmm, I wonder if I am really a Texan. 
I wasn't ever confused about that. But when we moved to Michigan, I found myself making some comparisons. I found myself making some judgmental observations about Michiganders. And uh, for starters, you do not drive correctly. It's way too fast. Uh, people say strange things here. They say, and what not? And they say, pop, instead of Coke. And uh, I never heard your state song. I don't know if you have a state song. And you eat weird things. You eat punchkis. And that is weird. And so when I was practicing for this, um, I, have, I always have my daughters like listen and be my audience. And my youngest daughter was like, you knew what a punchki was. People in Texas know what that is. And I was like, Cameron, we don't know what that is. I was like, let's text Aunt Bonnie. Let's see what she says about it. And so um, Thursday morning, I text my sister. And this is our conversation. It's going to pop up here on the screen for you. So I say to Bonnie, hi, BJ, question. Do you know what a punchki is? Pronounced punchki. No. Did you Google it? And then I start laughing. And I say, ah, I'm just trying to prove to Coco that this is more a Michigan thing than a Texas thing. It's a Polish donut. And then she's like, ha, ah, smiley faces. She says, I thought it was a bad word. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> and that was our text. And so Cameron was proved wrong uh, that morning. But now, all kidding set aside, um, I remember in that first year when we moved here, God asked me something very interesting. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, is it more important to be a child of Texas or my child? Yeah, he's, he's big though. See, the issue wasn't really Texas or Michigan. My identity crisis was that being a child of Texas felt more real than being a child of God. And God wanted so much more for me than that very limited perspective. And he wants so much more for all of us than a very limited, small perspective. And so I don't know where you are on, on this whole identity journey, this thing we call identity. But I would like you to consider uh, this thought, this blank. Um, how would you fill in? I am a child of... And think about heritage, tradition, genealogy, profession, title, whatever feels more real to you than being a child of God. And just sit with it for a little while. And here's our last thought. Regardless of how we feel, the truth is we are children of God. And that's pretty good news. Now, over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at identity in a variety of angles and perspectives. I really hope that you'll engage intentionally in this series as Dan continues with it, that you maybe even consider to grapple with other people by joining a small group. It's one hour a week, and um, it doesn't have to be your like a confessional. You're just pressing into some interesting questions with other people. Um, and I also hope that as Dan makes his way up here, that you just picture this amazing banquet table that God has prepared for you. And all of the food is here, just waiting for you to come up and feast from. And so my encouragement is just come up and eat. Just come up and feast. And uh, let his word do his thing inside of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. I, I wore plaid in honor of, of the Texas conversation. And, uh, Cotton Eye Joe, up here. Cotton Eye Joe. Oh, Let's do it. You got it. All right. Thanks so much. Hey, um, as, as she makes her way down again, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for, for doing that and, and for what, sharing what God laid on your heart. I want to point out again, the back of the vine, so this is page two of the vine, there are small groups that meet all week long. There are small groups that meet even today. You can join Lisa and Deb's small group. Um, if you are a female, that's, that's for the sisterhood, all ages. Um, that's a Google Meet. And then there are groups like Brad and Lisa Stull who help lead us in worship at the first service. They have a, a, they have a small group today at uh, 2 p.m. 
You can meet Austin Lambert, who was uh, led us in worship at this service. His small group actually is only for the worship team. So if you want to join the worship team, you can join his group, and then, and then on and on. So I would encourage you, again, email the leaders and uh, take that step into community. And again, you use the Digging Deeper questions as your curriculum. So, so let's, uh, let's do this. And so as Lisa mentioned, um, there is more to who she is there is more to her identity than just being a Texan. And that's true even if she doesn't feel like it's true. Now, being a Texan is a key part of who she is. Talks about it a lot, actually, being a Texan. <laughs> Comes up in board meetings. But there is more. There is more. And just like when it comes to our faith, there is more to our identity in Christ than we tend to think. It's bigger than we think. There's more to the good news of the gospel than we think. The gospel is bigger than we think. And those things are true even if they don't feel true. And so last Sunday, we kicked off this sermon series on our identity. It's called Imager. And today's sermon, week two of the series, is there's got to be more to Christianity than this. And I have a question for you. Do not answer out loud, but have you ever wondered that? Have you ever wondered, man, there's got to be more to this whole Christianity thing than what I'm living. I mean, you read the scriptures. You see characters in the Bible turning the world upside down literally for the glory of God, living life to the full. And then you look in the mirror at your life and you think about your earliest dreams of what your new life in Christ was going to be like, and over the years you realize what you had dreamed it would be to be a follower of Jesus, and the reality is often at the extremes. But I have a what-if question. I'm going to ask a bunch of what-if questions in my sermon today. And the first one is this. What if the problem isn't you? What if the problem is inadvertently you've accepted an incomplete gospel? I mean, what if there is more to the quote-unquote good news than the American form of our faith tends to think? What if the gospel is bigger than we think it is? That's where I'm headed today in my message. This is one of those put your thinking caps on sermons, and we're going to dig deep. Before we dive into the message, I want to point out on the back of your program, every single week there's always books and Bibles that we love to recommend. And my pastor's pick this week is a book by Putty Putman called Live Like Jesus. Putty is a pastor in the Vineyard Movement, which our church is affiliated with. You'll hear more about that at the Welcome Hour if you come to it, which I hope you do next week. Um, Putty is a, is a pastor at, at the Vineyard Church in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And he also was the one who founded School Kingdom Ministry, which I which I mentioned last week. And so a lot of what you're going to hear in today's sermon was, was uh, influenced by chapter two in that book. So check it out. And so as we press into, into the topic today, I want to start with a fun fact. Here's a fun fact. It's a did you know. Did you know if you were alive, if we were alive 2,000 years ago, you might be called a Christian or you might be called something else. The word Christian actually shows up in the Bible three times three times in the New Testament. And the first occurrence is here in Acts 11. It says that the followers, the, they were called Christians. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch, Acts 11, 26. So if you're alive 2,000 years ago, you might be called a Christian if you're a believer and follower of Jesus today. But you might be called something else. And here is that something else. This is one of the earliest ways Christians were referred to. This is from Acts chapter 24. And the Apostle Paul said this. He said, however, I admit that I, I will worship the God of our ancestors, here's the key, as a follower of the way, capital W, as a follower of the way. So Christians early on were known as followers of the way. And I like that because that implies movement. It, Im it implies action. You're on the way. So yes, we are often called believers, and yes, doctrine is super important, but what you do with what you believe 
matters way more than we tend to think in the American church. Our faith is sometimes called a walk, and our walk of faith is a journey. And like all journeys, like all journeys, in order to get to where you want to go, you need a complete set of directions. Because if you don't have a complete set of directions, you'll take wrong turns, you'll get lost, you'll probably get frustrated if you don't have a complete set of directions. Now, before we all had these things, smartphones, and before things like Google Maps and Waze existed, you had to actually use one of these things. This is a map. And so if we want to go down, if you, you want to head down to see Bonnie in El Paso, you had to use this. My kids have no idea what I'm holding right now. Like, Daddy, what is that peculiar thing? That's a map. And you had to know how to read one of those to get anywhere. Even if you want to travel across town, there is a street version, a street map of like Macomb County or Oakland County or Wayne County with every one street on there. But if, say, we wanted to hang out at the Schlinka household, their house wouldn't be on a street map. We would have to have them write out step-by-step -step directions. That's, that's old school. If you write out step-by-step -step directions on how to get from one place to another. And so let's just say with that in mind, we, we all had, we hopped in a time machine back when phones were like attached to walls with like the cord attached. And if you wanted privacy, you had to like go in the bathroom and talk to it because it was like right off the kitchen. That's what we did growing up. And so let's say you hop back in time machine when when you didn't have Google. Google wasn't a word yet. And let's just say, you and a couple of friends say, hey, you know what? Okay, we're starting a small group. Let's do this. We're going to do this thing. We're going to enter into community. We're going to use the digging deeper questions as our curriculum, and we're going to break bread. We're going to do it over lunch. And let's just say you invited me to join you. And, I, and you said, hey, Dan, pick the place, wherever you want to go. And I'm like, are you guys up for a little bit of a drive? And you're like, sure, why not? Wherever you want to go. And I'm like, all right, well, we're going out for pizza, which I know for you're like, whoa, wait a second, slow down. Um, and we're going to go to Louie's Pizza in Hazel Park. Now, how many people know of Louie's Pizza? Hands up. Be, come on, come on. The rest of you who have your hands up, you do not. Two hands, two hands for Joyce. She's like, come on, preach it. So let's say, let's say that you didn't know where Louie's was. You didn't have your phone. It's not on a map. So you asked me to write out step-by-step -step directions on how to get from the church to Louis Pizza. Here, in fact, are those step-by-step -step directions in case you were wondering. Let's look at them. There are 10 steps. So you exit the parking lot. You go right on Shelby Road, hang it right on 23, left on Ryan, left on Auburn. Auburn jogs and turns into Mound Road. You go south on Mound Road. Then you merge into 696 westbound, very important. Then you go exit at DeQuinder, go left down to Quinder, and then you turn right into, in, into Louis Pizza. If you get to Nine Mile, you went too far. That's very important. Very important. That last step. So you don't just keep driving down to Quinder. So those are 10 steps. You have to follow all 10 of them to get to Louis Pizza. But well, let's say, let's just say for some reason I decided to have some fun and I removed six steps and I left you with these four. Here we go. Directions from the Mission Church of Louis Pizza. You go right on Shelby Road, right on 23 Mile, then you merge onto 696 and you turn right into Louis Pizza. Now here's, here's, what's, here's what's important to understand. Every one of those steps is true. Those steps are accurate but they are incomplete. If you don't have a complete set of directions, you will take wrong turns, you'll get lost, you'll get frustrated. And I share that story, had a little bit of fun to say this. What if that is what has happened when it comes to our faith as followers of the way? What if the gospel that we tend to believe is not wrong, but it's incomplete? What if we have, this is important, what if we have the steps of the gospel to get us to heaven? But what if we don't have 
all of the gospel we need in order to experience what Jesus himself said. John 10, 10, Amplified Translation. He says, the thief, the devil, comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. What if the gospel that we tend to believe and embrace is not wrong, but it's incomplete? And what if that is why more often than not that verse and the promises of it elude us? Where again, you look at your life and you realize your earliest dreams of what it meant to have a new life in Christ, to be a new creation in Christ, and all that's going to be like is far from a reality of what you're experiencing. And again, what if the problem is not you, but what if you have inadvertently accepted an incomplete gospel? What if there is more to the good news than the American form of Christianity tends to think? What if our gospel is bigger than we think it is? And what if the good news is actually better than we tend to think? Now, when it comes to the gospel, one of the most popular ways to communicate it contains four truths. There's four truth statements. And so to stick with this theme of how to get to Louis Pizza, I want to give you directions of the gospel with directions and quotation marks. Here are the four steps of the way the gospel is often communicated um, in the American church. Here are the directions. Step one, God created the world and he wants to be in relationship with us. Step two, but we rebelled against God by sinning, so we are separated from God. Step three, so God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Step four, if we receive Jesus as our personal savior, then when we die, we'll go to heaven. And again, those are the four steps of the directions of the gospel. That's often the way the gospel is defined. And by the way, we need to respond to that. You can respond to that right now in your seat or maybe during communion where you open up, you, you read through those four steps, you embrace them. Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, you're dying on the cross for my sins. Like that is an eternity changing prayer. It is. I, I remember when I was first introduced to the gospel in that form about 25 years ago. I mean, I remember thinking, man, that is really good news. And in fact, that's what it means in the original Greek. In the original Greek, gospel is the word euangelion, and it means good news. And in fact, it's great news. If you accept Jesus as your Savior, you will spend eternity in heaven, in paradise, after you die. And heaven's not just like sit on a cloud playing a harp. It's so much more. And so when you think about it, that version of the gospel is very good news. And so don't hear me wrong on this. I believe those four directions are core truths that we all need to accept. But the question I want to ask in this sermon today is, are those step-by-step -step directions of the gospel as they tend to be presented, are they similar to the directions to Louis Pizza that I gave you, the shorter set that only contained four parts to it, where every part of those four parts was accurate, but there were several key steps removed. So my sermon today, I'm going to raise some questions. I might be creating some theological tension in your minds. That's okay. We need to love God with our minds. We need to pray into these things, search the scriptures, talk about them in your small group, and see how the Holy Spirit leads you. But I want to ask a tough question. I want to ask a tough question. When it comes to the good news, when it comes to the gospel, and here is the tough question. How much does the resurrection matter? Now, you may not have noticed, but when I shared those four step-by-step -step directions of the gospel, I did not mention Jesus rising from the dead. Once again, here are the four steps, the four directions of the gospel. And you can read through those. Didn't alter the slide. Again, how the gospel is often defined in the American church. And if that is the complete gospel... If that is everything that makes up the good news, then how much does the resurrection actually matter? Now, obviously, right, we are happy that Jesus didn't stay dead, right? We're happy about that. We're happy on the third day that he rose again in fulfillment of scriptures. But how much does the resurrection matter when it comes to our salvation? 
I want you to think about that. Because we want to say, yes, it matters. Like, it's everything. It's, yes, the resurrection matters. It has to matter. Like, doesn't it? But if it does, then why isn't it mentioned in the directions of the gospel as it's often communicated? I, would just, I want you to embrace that tension. Here's a key thought. The version of the gospel we often hear tends to focus on the crucifixion while ignoring the empty tomb. And the question is, is, is that okay? Is it okay that the version of the gospel we often hear communicated with those four step-by-step -step directions, it focuses on the crucifixion, but it completely ignores the resurrection? I mean, if Jesus died on the cross, but he didn't rise on the third day, like, would anything be different for us? Now, as Christians, right, we believe the Bible is God's word. It's the inspired text, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it's what God wanted to communicate to us is written down for us. So we believe the Bible is the word of God. So all of our theology ought to come from the scripture. It has to be rooted and grounded in the Bible. And this is something you may not realize as you read the Bible. But the Apostle Paul ties our salvation not only to the death of Jesus, but he also ties it to the resurrection of Jesus. And we often don't hear that with those four step-by-step -step versions of the gospel that are communicated. And so I want to prove that to you. And I'm going to use the scriptures to do it. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. Now, I want you to notice what Paul says and what he doesn't say in this passage. Notice that in, in Romans 10, 9, Paul does not say, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he died for your sins, then you'll be saved. That's what we kind of read into the text, but it's not there in that verse. Instead, what he said was, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, what? That God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. Now, again, just to be clear, I believe the apostle Paul, as do I, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's obviously a core truth of the gospel, but that's not what Paul says here. Paul is saying the resurrection like really, 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 really matters. And that should be a clue to us that the gospel is bigger than we think it is. The, the good news is better than we tend to believe as well. Now, when you read the scriptures, again, believing that Jesus rose from the dead is not like an afterthought. It's not like a cool trick after the cross, like, hey, got a little bit more, just for no apparent reason, I'm going to rise from the dead. It's a lot more than that. Instead, believing that Jesus rose from the dead is actually, again, it's critical, not just for our theology, but for our salvation. Here's what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Whole chapter is about the resurrection. Here's what it says in the 17th verse. Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're actually still in your sins. Now again, notice what Paul does not say in this verse. He does not say, listen, he does not say, and if Christ has not been crucified on the cross, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. He doesn't say that in this verse. Again, he believes that, that's part of the gospel. But in this verse, he says very clearly, if Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. And so that tells me again, the good news of the gospel of Jesus is bigger than we think. So yes, the gospel involves the cross, but the gospel also better include the resurrection. When the step-by-step -step directions we give about the gospel don't mention anything about the empty tomb, then those directions are incomplete. They've got to be. And again, it's not my opinion. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying the resurrection of Jesus really, really matters. And that tells us that the gospel is bigger than we tend to think it is. The good news is better than we realize. And so again, what if our understanding of the gospel is true, 
But what if it's incomplete? What if we have inadvertently removed some of the steps without realizing it and left ourselves with just four of the steps? Again, four steps that are critical, four steps that are true, four steps we need to embrace. But what if without realizing it, our truthful understanding of the gospel is an incomplete truth? And what if that's the reason why we wonder, wouldn't admit it, maybe in our small group, but you'd wonder, man, there's got to be more to Christianity than what I'm living. There's got to be. I read this Bible, look at the book of Acts in the early church, and I'm like, they're there, and I'm here. But what if the problem isn't you? What if, what if the problem is we have inadvertently accepted an incomplete gospel? Again, what if the steps of the gospel we have to get, get us to heaven, which they can, but what if we do not have all the gospel we need in order to live the lives to the full that Jesus said he came to give us? Here's what Putty Putman wrote in Live Like Jesus. He said, I urge you to examine the gospel as you know it. If the gospel is good enough that God himself calls it good news, then it should probably be unbelievably, ridiculously good. He says, think about it. Would the best news that you personally received in the last year have been big enough for God to call it really, really good news, let alone the good news? He says, indeed, if the gospel is really good news to God, it should be the kind of news that just at a moment's reflection on it brings an unconscious smile to your face. It should be so good that remembering it on our worst days cheers us up. He says it must be so amazing that we spend the rest of our lives discovering how good it is. Every day a discovery that is even better than we realized the day before. It should be the kind of news we struggle to believe is true. In fact, the kind of news it takes faith to believe. But he ends with this. He said, most of us do not feel that way about the gospel. But I ask, what if we could? What if we could feel that way about the gospel? Again, the kind of news that in a moment's reflection brings an unconscious smile. Like, why are you smiling? Because the gospel's true. I can't not smile. And you're going through just like that valley, whatever's going on in our world and in politics and the economy. And on the worst days, you think about the gospel and it cheers you up. You can't not not be happy. And that's what the gospel should be. It should be so amazing that we spend like our lives just, it's like an onion peeling back layer after layer and you never get to the center ever on this side of heaven. And the discoveries of it are even better than the day before. He says it should be the kind of news we struggle to believe is true. In fact, it should be the kind of news it takes faith to believe, even when you don't feel like it's true. So what if, what if the gospel actually is as good as God says it is? I mean, wouldn't you want to discover that? And, and here's, here's the thing. What if a key aspect of the gospel involves our identity? What if it involves our identity? What if a key part of the gospel involves who we are and who God says we are? And what if we began to embrace the full gospel, which includes the four steps I shared earlier, and it includes more? And what if that more, quote-unquote, involved our identity? What if a key aspect of the good news of the gospel is all about our identity? What if a key aspect of the gospel obviously includes what happens after we die? But what if a key aspect of the gospel includes what happens between now and when we go to heaven? All that time in between, because there's a lot of it. We're living that like right now. And it really matters. We're not just like biding our time in a spiritual lazy boy waiting to breathe our last breath. Did everything God ever wants me to do. I prayed that prayer. But 
But what if a key aspect of the gospel should include what happens between now and when we go to heaven as a result of accepting Jesus as Savior and Lord? What if a key aspect of the good news of the gospel is about our identity? And all the scriptures that I shared with you last week when we kicked off the series, the fact that we really do become new creations in Christ, that we were crucified with Christ, no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The fact that we aren't kind of dead to sin or mostly dead, but dead to sin. That's good news. We don't believe it. It doesn't feel true, but it is. What if the fact that we are co-heirs with Christ, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, Galatians 4, that was shared earlier by Lisa, what if that's part of the gospel? The good news, that's good news. What if the fact that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you and me? And he does. He's the Holy Spirit. See, when we understand our identity, when we understand who we are in Christ, and what was really accomplished, what was really accomplished with both the crucifixion and the resurrection, both the cross and the empty tomb, if we understood those things, it would be a true game changer for us. It really would. If we really understood what was accomplished with the crucifixion and the resurrection, both the cross and the empty tomb, If we understood those things, I believe what Jesus said in John 10, 10 would become true for us. We'd feel it. John 10, 10, where Jesus said, the thief, which is Satan, comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. But then Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I mean, what if these words of Jesus, right? He wasn't lying there, right? What if these words of Jesus could be more than just pie in the sky or more just for a few select people? But what if they were a day-by-day, moment-by-moment reality for anyone who is a follower of the way? See, I believe the thief, the devil, has robbed us of our identity and he has got us to embrace an incomplete gospel. Again, where we have enough of it to get to heaven. But between now and then, we're nowhere near as effective as we could be to join God in what he's doing to make his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The thief has robbed us of our identity, but Jesus wants to give it back to us. It's part of the reason why he was crucified and why he rose. And so in this series, I pray that we take back what was stolen from us, really what we surrendered to the enemy when it comes to our identity. I just wanted to leave that with you today, and then we're going to continue to dig deep next week and just to continue to go deeper and deeper, saying, okay, what is the full gospel? How, what, what are the parts of the identity of the gospel that we need to fully embrace so that we can live out John 10, 10. And that's what we're preaching next week. To be continued. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to spend some time now responding.